Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Hope you're doing well and hope you've grabbed some lunch or you've already eaten um, for this lunch and learn session. My name's Nicola and I work in the sustainability team at, at Waverley Council. Before we get started, I just wanted to firstly acknowledge the Gidigal and Gadigal people that traditionally occupied the Sydney coast and acknowledge Aboriginal elders of all lands where we are based today. Before um, we actually start the presentation, I really want to get a sense of who's actually attending and who's in the room today with a few questions in our first poll. So if you could just take a, a minute to answer the, the three questions on this poll here, hopefully you can um, see it now. Um, the first is, where do you live? Do you live in an apartment or a house? The second is, um, do you rent or own a property? And the third is, have you bought or do you currently buy green power? So I'll give that a few more um, seconds. We'll see who's in the room. <laughs> oh, so there's definitely quite a, oh, relatively even split between apartment dwellers and, and people who live in houses. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, so, you know, that's that's what I thought would happen. Um, interestingly enough, 50 or a lot over 50% of people live in apartments in our um, council area. Do you rent or own? Most of you own your property, which is uh, another interesting um, factor and um, some of you have actually bought or have uh, are buying green power that's that's encouraging to see with a third of you who um, have had some experience with green power previously thank you for um, for yeah sharing some of those details with us um, sorry I should have shared the results <laughs> but um, those sorts of factors, especially where you live in an apartment or a house, and if you rent or own, that do do come into play when you're um, with regards to green electricity and even solar power. So, and some of that will be covered in the talk today. Um, yeah, so everyone's mute. Um, if you can stay on mute, if you have any questions. Um, pop them in the Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A section. Um, we'll have breaks during the talk where um, we'll hopefully answer, the, answer them. Thanks to all of you who've actually registered, when you registered, you put in um, your questions. And I think we've got most of them covered in our talk today. If you are having any tech issues, please pop them in the chat and um, my lovely co-host, Suze, will try and sort them out for you. Um, and um, yeah, we will be recording the webinar and be sending it out with some the presentation slides and some other useful resources um, in the next day or so. So today you'll hear from Adam Corrigan. You see his lovely face on the screen there. <laughs> um, he's from Your Energy Friend and he's going to share his knowledge and insights surrounding green electricity, solar power, electricity fundamentals. But we're also fortunate fortunate to have um, a representative from the Green Power team, uh, Costin. You see his beautiful backdrop with some wind farms and a big gum tree there, who will be available to answer any specific Green Power questions along the way. Um, so um, yeah, let's start. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Nicola. Well, we'll just jump, jump straight in. Um, yeah. Some reason now I can't share slide. Here we go. We're away. Um, so this is me. Um, I've been uh, conducting home energy assessments and running workshops along this line slash webinars for about 12, 13 years now. We primarily our core business is going to people's homes and/or businesses and showing them how to reduce their electricity usage, make their home more comfortable, or reduce their carbon footprint. I call it one of the three C's: cost, carbon, or comfort. It's up to them. Pretty much it's all the same thing. You see, achieves pretty much the same results at the end of the day. Um, we're independent. That's a key thing. So we don't have any commercial relationship with any product provider. So that's me. That's who I am. So we've only got now. So let's jump in. So if I go into a home, uh, this is what I like to push. This is 
um, kind of what I call my five steps. So it's all about understanding your energy bill, number one, understand how much I'm using, what are my tariffs, how much am I paying per kilowatt hour, how much am I paying per megajoule of gas, am I on a time of use contract, am I on a flat tariff, same rate 24 hours a day. Number two, shop around, get the best rate. Most most households that I go into, I can show them how to you know, knock 10, 15, 20% off their bills if they haven't shopped around in the last couple of years. And that's the majority of homes that we go into or we know all the majority of people we speak to. Um, there's, a really good, there's really good opportunities out there for, um, <clears throat> for shopping around. Uh, there's a great uh, government website, which we'll jump into. The other thing with number two is, yeah, buy green power. That's the first step in going green. Number three, become energy efficient. Yeah, so start to understand where you're using energy and where you're wasting power. Um, and that's where your opportunities are for savings. Uh, yeah, most homes we go into, we can show them how to save, you know, 30, 40% of their total electricity consumption just by being energy efficient. Um, get solar, number four. It's if you've got the opportunity, if you've got available sunlight, and most of you own your own home or if you're in a, an apartment, there's great opportunities there for you to be putting solar in. It's pretty reliable. Sun comes up every day. Sometimes it's cloudy, very rarely. If you live in Sydney, it's great. Um, not much can go wrong with the solar system. Very, very, very reliable. Um, and number five, yeah, keep your eye on batteries. It's just an interesting place in the market at the moment, what's happening with them price point wise and, and how it can work for you, depending on your energy usage, your available disposable income. There's a few different variables about that. So there's a lot happening. So keep your eye on that part of the marketplace. So electricity. When you buy your electricity, you buy a unit called a kilowatt hour. Just like you buy a kilo of potatoes or a, or a litre of petrol, you buy a kilowatt hour of electricity. So that's 1,000 watts used for one hour. So say you had this little, uh, you know, say that's a 1,000 watt electric heater, um, you left it on for one hour at full capacity, it would use one kilowatt hour, 1,000 watts over one hour, one kilowatt hour. Now any and all electrical appliances in your home will have a little compliance plate on them. So this first one, as you can see, it draws a maximum 250 watts. The second one, and oh, she's having converted that one, but yeah, 130 watts on that. So if you run that first one for a full hour, full capacity, it's going to be consuming 0.25 of a kilowatt hour. Now, depending on what tariff you're on, the average is about 30 cents. 0.25 of that would be about seven and a half cents per per hour to run that 250 watt device. So that's how you figure out um, what what different devices in your home are using. Now, when we talk about tariffs, that's the rate that you're being charged for your electricity by your electricity retailer. Um, so you can be on two different tariffs in New South Wales at the moment. You can be on a time of use tariff or a flat tariff. There's a whole bunch of variables on those as well, particularly the time of use. But generally, time of use is, yeah, uh, peak rate 2 p.m. till 8 p.m. on weekdays only. It's about 58, 60 cents per kilowatt hour. Those rates are actually coming down a little bit at the moment. Um, off peak is 10 p.m. till 7 a.m seven days a week, it's about 14 cents a kilowatt hour, and solar is the rest of the time. So it's up to you. So it gives you the opportunity to say, well, hey, look, I've got solar on my home. I can put my dishwasher on this morning because it's nice and sunny. I'm getting free power from the sun. It's cloudy, it's been rainy all day. Well, I'll run it overnight when it's only costing me 14 cents a kilowatt hour. I'm buying green power, I'm achieving the same thing. We're using renewable energy. The alternative, if you've got a smart meter, you can be on either of these. You can be on a time of use tariff or a flat tariff. The flat tariff, same rate, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you've got one of these accumulation meters, old school meter, and they're all slowly being phased out around the state, um, you obviously doesn't know what time of day, the day it is, so you can only ever be on that flat rate. So, any questions there? Can they come up yet, Nicola? Nope, okay, we'll move along. So the reason I say shop around is because this is a little bit old, this, this research now, but as you can see there, the blue line is what's called a standing offer from Asia, Origin, and Energy Australia over those three different time periods. Um, now, the difference between the standing offer for a company and their lowest available offer is basically you guys making a phone call, ringing them up and saying, hey, hey, go Origin, Energy Australia, Joe Bloggs Electricity Supply Company, whoever you're buying your electricity or gas from, ring them up, make a call, and say, hey, I want a better deal, otherwise I'm going elsewhere. So before you do that, sorry, you want to jump on this website. This is a federal government website. It's called energymadeeasy.gov.au. So what you do is you jump in there, you have your electricity and all your gas bills, you put in your electricity and your gas consumption on just do one or the other. 
up to you. And it will then go through and look at every single retail, mark, uh, available, retail offer available on the marketplace and will put it into a nice little list for you, which will look like that. And there'll be 30 or 40 of these. I can only screenshot three of them at the top of the page. Um, and it'll say, this is the cheapest one based on your consumption, okay? So it will go out and look at every single retail market. All of them have to be registered on that Energy Made Easy website, every retail offer. Um, and it'll basically, a search, a little algorithm will go across and say, hey, look, based on your consumption, this is the best available for you, okay? And so if you don't do that, we'll, your energy retailer will just simply roll you back onto that standing offer, which is probably 15, 20% higher than what you could be paying. So shop around. If you don't shop around, they'll hit you. So emissions by sector, why are we advocating to get green power? Well, as you can see here, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna move this little window so that I can read the graph, it's really annoying. Um, Electricity is the biggest generator of emissions in our yeah, for the country. Um, so it's the biggest sector, and then the stationary energy, then it goes into transport, et cetera, et cetera. But the electricity sector is the biggest opportunity for emission savings. Um, so how can we affect that? Well, it's in the power that we choose to buy. So, this is getting annoying actually. Sorry, everyone. I'm oh, just having a small screen. Um, so where does most of that electricity that we're generating and using, where does it come from? Well, this is since 1992 through to 2018. And as you can see, black coal is slowly diminishing down the bottom, that's in the dark blue. Brown coal is the lighter blue, as you can see, that's slowly diminishing. Renewables, which is the next, uh, sorry, natural gas is slightly increasing as well. But what's probably increasing the most is renewables. And then you've got a little bit of oil being used at the top. So what we're trying to do is, well, myself, that's my motivator, is trying to get more green power or more renewable energy into that grid, into the network, so that we can be available to all homes. Um, and we can do that a couple of different ways. We can either purchase that through purchasing green power, or we can um, put on solar panels and generate our own. So when we talk about that network, Australian, um, it's basically one big grid across the eastern seaboard from Queensland all the way down through New South Wales. And this is just a little thing, little snapshot of what it looks like in New South Wales. And if you drill down into this and zoom in, you can see that there's wind farms and solar and coal and jet gas plants and all that sort of thing all plugged into that grid. Now that electricity is just being shipped anywhere. So when we talk about the electricity that's coming through your power point, we don't really know where that particular electron's been generated from. It's part of one big, basically, mix. Once it's been put into that, uh, that network, away it goes. So what, what we're trying to demonstrate here is it's one big mix, and that network extends down into Victoria, up into Queensland, across to South Australia, and even goes down to Tasmania. There's cable that runs across past straits. So it's one big network across the east coast of Australia. Um, WA is on their own, Northern Territory, completely different setup. So what you can do, push the market to buy or to install and generate more renewable energy is buy green power. Now green power is a federal government brand. Um, so 1997, um, John Howard basically said, okay, look, if you guys wanna buy renewables, well, we'll give you a market option. So People were they then did is the federal government so right okay you can only you, you want to you can buy green power through your accredited retailer um, and what that means is if you buy your electricity through AGL Origin whoever you do and you say I want to buy 100% green power or 50% green power it means that in that marketplace they then have to buy the equivalent from you oh, sorry from the marketplace on your behalf so if you say what you use a thousand kilowatt hours over the year and you say I want to start 100% green power that's what they have to purchase on your behalf. So at the end of the year, the government comes in, checks all the numbers, make sure they've done the right thing. Yes, you can continue to sell green power. So that's effectively how it works. Um, you can only buy, it's only post 1997, um, green, uh, renewable energy. So things like the Snowy Hydro and that sort of thing, they're not part of the green power scheme. So pretty much every retailer out there will sell you green power. It's just they sell you different rates of it, some will only send you 50%, it's, it's up to them. But you can actually filter through that um, the Energy Made Easy um, website. You can actually filter and say, look, I just want to look at green power auctions only. Um, so it's up to you, chop around, I do it. Cost me a couple of extra cents per kilowatt hour, it's nothing, less than a cup of coffee over a week. Okay. 
Yes. And then there's a question actually regarding the Energy Made Easy website. Mm -hmm. uh, that it doesn't seem to readily show 100% green power options. No, it doesn't. So is there, is, there a better energy, is there a better energy comparison site? Not for 100% green power, or well, not that I know of, but what you can do with the Energy Made Easy website is you can filter for green power options and then you have to look through each and every one um, and then you just call your retailer. Um, but yeah, there is there are other options for buying greener alternatives and there's the green electricity guide. And so you can look at that and that will, this is done by, oh geez, sorry, the brain fade here. Um, so you can basically jump in the green electricity guide and that'll tell you who they've done basically some research and said these are the greener providers of electricity. Now, not all of them are green, as in green power. A lot of them, such as power shop, they're buying carbon offsets to offset your usage. So um, it's a different methodology. It's a different way. I'm not saying it's one's bad or one's good. Um, but what I would say is that if I had my choice in my home, I produce, prefer to use green power, um, be, I prefer to purchase green power, um, because I know that that's pushing the market to install more new, new renewables in Australia. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Go. Um, the Green Electricity Guide was, I think, developed by the Total Environment Centre and Sorry. Greenpeace. Um, and mm -hmm. it was done to, in 2018. And if you go into that website, it, it, it um, explains all the criteria by which, by which they've ranked the, these um, retailers. So it's worth having a look when, if you're looking at um, purchasing renewable energy. Thanks, Nicola. You tidied up my verbal overload. So we'll move on. So there's a lot of movement uh, now in the marketplaces. People are, you know, just for, for whatever's motivating you um, to try and to get out of fossil fuels. Um, and a lot of homes are doing this. And there's a couple of different reasons for it. I mean, I'm getting out of gas because, well, the only thing that's left on my home, on, in my home that runs on gas is the, the cooking hob. Um, I'd rather use induction. Um, if I get rid of the gas, well, I'm not paying a 60 cents daily connection fee, and I'm pretty much taking my home to being 100% green power. I've got solar panels on the roof. I buy 100% certified green power. I eliminate the gas. I save money, and I'm doing the right thing by the environment. So it's a double win. So yeah, that daily connection fee is costing me, you know, it's over $200 a year before I use a megajoule of gas. And my gas usage component just in my cooking it's really quite minimal. Um, it's, you know, it's only paying out of $200 per year. It's probably only another $30, $40 a year in gas usage just for cooking. So but it's, it's yeah, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me to be using gas anymore. No such thing really as green gas or 100% renewable gas. Um, yeah, induction cooktops are great. So you can eliminate um, gas cooking. It pumps for hot water. So if you've got gas hot water i know so a lot of you are in apartments so that's a little bit more more challenging but it's, it's definitely something that can't be overcome is getting rid of your gas um heating for hot water um and yeah look for heating and cooling your home as opposed to particularly for the heating yeah, you can definitely use uh, a high efficiency air conditioners i've just installed one last uh, earlier on this year and we used it even this winter absolutely fantastic and so very very efficient um, cost me very, very little to run, a lot less than using a gas heater over the last couple of years. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, buy 100% certified green power and you're pretty much taking your home to being, yeah, 100% green. Hey, Adam, are you, are you right to answer a few questions now? Certainly, it'd be great. <laughs> Sick of hearing um, my own voice. <laughs> One question's come through um, about smart meters. Can I yep. change to a smart meter by request? You can. Yeah, you can. Um, the first is it. Look, the first way, the first starting point is to call your electricity retailer. So whoever you're buying your electricity from, um, and they will help you start that process. Um, so yes, you definitely can. Then most likely, depending on who your retailer is, there could be a cost involved. Um, most meters are slowly being phased out by Osgrid, the network company, um, but they've kind of slowed that process down over the last couple of years. Alternatively, 
if you are thinking of going solar, when you install that solar, your meter will be changed as part of that installation process. Is that a, is that a mandatory? Um, there's a question about, uh, there's concern around EMF radiation in relation to smart meters, but if they're putting solar on their property, they are required to have a smart meter to sell back to the grid. Yes, yeah, so is if you... That's exactly right. So if you're putting solar in, it needs to be a bi-directional meter so that it can record how much solar power you're gener generating, sending back out onto the grid, any excess that goes back out, and how much you're buying in. Um, so your meter has to be upgraded if you're installing solar and being connected to the grid. Um, electromagnetic EMFs, I don't know anything about it. That's, that's the, I do energy efficiency, that's my focus. So I wouldn't, wouldn't care to comment on that. There's a, um, a kind of distribution question here on electricity distribution. There's a lot of talk about big solar and wind being forced to ramp down capacity west of Wagga Wagga. Is it possible to push coal out when there's capacity constraints? Uh, look, that, that's really what's happening in the network. Um, uh, yeah, transmission and distribution is it's, it's so incredibly complicated. Um, and there's that much going on in that area of the market. It's really going to be up to the Australian energy market operator um, and other legislative bodies, bodies and entities to, to come in and manage that. Um, and look, they're going to have to because at the end of the day, nobody's installing, you know, no one's installing new coal-fired power plants. So the network is, is changing dramatically. So it's really about how we manage that going forward. So with regards to exactly what's happening west of Wagga Wagga, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, that's not my area, but yeah, it is a very, very challenging environment at the moment um, with what's happening in the network area. So yeah, and that's not really our focus today, but yeah, happy to have a chat with you afterwards. Okay. Um, and then a quick question, can you use induction with solar? I think that's a yes. Um, so you can use induction with solar, yes, definitely. Um, and... Um, and is there the question about, is there any potential to put greener gas such as hydrogen through the current gas network? Do you know Ooh, anything about that, Adam? No, um, but yeah, I'd suggest, I'm going to a hydrogen conference online in a couple of days, so um, I can tell you after that, but I wouldn't have thought so, no. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't care to offer a definitive no, but I wouldn't have thought so. <laughs> Excellent. I think there's a lot of work happening in the hydrogen space, so um, definitely watch that space, but I think we're, we're not there yet. Um, yeah, no, okay. it's well, a long way off. There are a few more questions, but we'll wait um, maybe to the next break, because I think some of them might be covered off in the next part. So, okay, yeah. we'll move along. Um, so this is my, this is what I'm passionate about, and I've been passionate about energy efficiency since I started my little business. Um, and the reason for that is because it's the low hanging fruit. It's the easy option. It's the easy way to save money. Um, and there's lots of opportunity there. Now, when you speak about those opportunities as well, well where do we use our most, the most energy in our home? Well, number one is hot water. Now, some homes I go into that can be as high as 60% of your total energy consumption is just hot water because they've got old, inefficient storage hot water systems. Um, then it's heating and cooling, so there's lots of opportunity there. Then it's refrigeration and it slowly drips down into, you know, standby power and those other sort of areas. So obviously, as I said, the biggest area for opportunity is in those larger pieces of hot water, the heating and cooling and those sort of things. Um, so, and this is what a lot of people kind of get mixed up with is they think, oh, well, I want to be green. Well, let's just throw as many panels onto my roof and, and that'll make everything wonderful. But it's not going to make your home more comfortable. Sure, you'll just run your air conditioner a little bit more often during the day and you'll be able to run it off renewable energy from your own solar panels. But unless you seal your house up, your air conditioner is just going to be running really hard and all that cool air that you're creating in summer or the heat in winter is just going to duck straight back out of the house. So it's really important to seal your house up. And insulation is really, really cheap. You can retrofit an entire house walls ceiling and floor for about eight, $9,000. So it's a really cheap, low-hanging fruit and it'll make your home more comfortable in summer and winter. So insulation's really easy, seal your house up. And in Australia, particularly over, probably over in the eastern suburbs, I do a lot of older homes over there, the insulation's rubbish, it, it's faded away, it's compressed, 
just jump onto it. It's nice and easy. It's cheap, easy to install. So yeah, I'm a massive advocate for insulation. The other thing is seal your house up. The number of homes I go into with is gaps around doors, windows, those wall vents that people have. Every time you've got a heater on or a cooling device on, all that hot and cold air is just exchanging. So you're just wasting energy. It, it's a massive thing in your home. So if you go into Europe, anyone probably, some of you probably might have watched um, Grand Designs, you, you know, uh, what's his name, Kevin? Um, <clears throat> a lot of the time they'll do what's called a door blower test on a property. So they actually close all the doors and windows, put an expandable frame into the front door, and they try and suck air out of the house to test how airtight the home is. Um, now you have to pass one of those tests in all of Europe and all of North America. In Australia, we don't even have really a standard. So as such, our homes are leaky. Um, and particularly in Sydney and the Eastern so there's a lot of older housing stock. But it's also led to this, this culture within builders um, that it's not a requirement. So it's not something they have to focus on. I've got a builder, I'm just down with the snow now. Bill I was speaking with my mate down here, he's a builder, he builds, you know, up in Threadbow. They have to make the homes airtight. It's a completely different concept to my mates that are builders up in Sydney on the Northern Beaches, where it's not such a big thing. Um, but it's really easy to seal your house up. Number one, insulation. And then it's about going around and sealing up all those little gaps. Average, average home in New South Wales has a one square metre hole in it. So around your door jams, around your windows, around your skirting boards, all of those sort of things. So when we do a home energy assessment, we actually go in with a thermal camera. And that's a little image I took at a home a couple of months ago. And that was just, yeah, um, you can see the air coming in underneath that door. And there you can actually see it visually. So most homes, it's easy. Go down to the big hardware chains and there'll be a whole aisle of this sort of stuff. Draft stripping, draft excluders, seal your house up. I can't express that enough. It's easy to do and it'll make your home more comfortable for you to live in. So next is heating and cooling. So essentially the, the most energy efficient way to heat and or cool your home now is with a high efficiency air conditioner. Now, as I mentioned, I installed one just, over, oh, just earlier this year. Absolutely fantastic. Cools pretty much the whole house. It's not ducted. Um, it's only set to do, I've only got a small home. Um, and it runs off about 800 watts when it's running at full capacity. And that does pretty much the bulk of the house. If I go to some of the older houses with, you know, 10 year old air conditioners, they can have four, five, six, seven, eight kilowatts of air conditioning capacity. And that system is just running flat, flat. So the reason that they become more efficient is because um, the air conditioners themselves, the technology is becoming more and more and more efficient. So, when you buy those air conditioners, make sure you buy a high efficiency, buy a decent brand, buy something with a really good warranty. The other thing with an air conditioner, you can run it off your solar. You can cool your house down the hot day because it's sunny outside. I um, mean, winter, a lot of the time, well, it's still sunny, but it might be cool. Um, so you can run it off your solar. If, you, if it's overcast, well, you can run it off green power. So you can do the right thing by the environment and keep your house uh, warm and or cool. So yeah, there's options there for you, but definitely high efficiency air conditioning is the way to go with the heating and cooling at home these days. The other thing to consider is, yeah, use fans. The thing that cools your body down more than anything else is air movement. So when you create that cold air out of your air conditioner, the first thing it's gonna to want to do is hug the floor and look to escape and, and um, in exchange with hot air through underneath the skirting board or out underneath the door jam or through the gaps in your floorboards. And the idea is you want to seal those gaps up and then you want to pick that cold air up with a fan and blow it across your body. The thing that cools your body down is cold air moving across your skin, okay? One of those little fans, yeah, like you're talking 30, 40 watts, cost you two cents an hour to run. Air conditioning themselves run at about, depending on the size, 50 cents to $2 an hour to run. Excuse me. Um, and the idea with your air conditioner is for every one degree you turn it down in summer or for every one degree you turn it up in winter, use an additional 10% of energy. So if you can offset that by just running a fan to move that, bring the hot air back down to you or that cool it up to you for a couple of cents, well worth your while, okay? So use fans, it's all about air movement. So yeah, fans are great. If you don't have ceiling fans, buy a little pedestal fan. Very cheap, easy to run. The next big area of opportunity is hot water. So now I've kind of gone from left to right across the screen with regards to 
let's just go with the general efficiency. Um, not talking about which is the most efficient um, with regards to energy or it's uh, the energy that's the input energy. But look, for me, I would, number one, this is where my old electric storage hot water system goes. When it goes pop, I will put in a thermosiphon hot water system. That will go up my roof. Why? I've got lots of roof space. I've got lots of available sunshine. Um, I want to clear the area down the side of, oh, sorry, it's actually inside in the cupboard. I don't want to put a big tank on the outside of my house because I want access down that side of the house and it's only a very narrow, narrow passageway as it is. So that ticks all my boxes. No moving parts, no sensors, no controllers, stick it up and away it goes. Been commercialized for the last 50 years, not much can go wrong with them. So that works for me. Next underneath is what's called a heat pump. So it's essentially a high efficiency air conditioner attached to a storage tank. You can run it off your solar, fantastic. If there's no sunshine, we can run it off green power. You can run it overnight on that off-peak rate, nice and cheap for you. So very, very, very efficient. So when you look at these um, renewable forms of hot water, um, you basically get a form of government rebate or an STC um, or a REC. And so the thermosiphon and all these hot water systems all get around about the same level of government rebate when we can look at litre for litre of, of, um, of capacity. So the next along is basically what's called a, um, a vacuumous glass tube hot water storage system. So that will have a tank attached to it. Um, the tank will be sitting down on the ground and there's a little sensor up in the top of those tubes and it'll say, oh, it's nice and hot now, let's run the pump. It'll run the pump through there. Heat's gathering in those tubes, goes into the heat exchange manifold, creates hot water, goes into your storage tank, away you go. Once again, very, very efficient using the sun to create, electric, uh, to create hot water. Um, if not, if there's no sunshine, once again, you just boost the tank, you can do it off the off-peak rate, do it on green power, and everyone's a winner. The next is the sort of technology that I've got. It's an old electric storage, hot water system. Really, really, really inefficient way to create that hot water. But you can run it off green power. So if that's the only option you've got in your home right now, well, you can turn around your retail and say, well, give me 100% of credit to green power. And all of a sudden, you can have a hot shower and go, well, it's coming from renewable energy, so I'm, I'm still winning. Um, the next is an instantaneous gas hot water system, the little box that a lot of my mics have in a lot of the apartments. Um, now, yeah, there's, as I said, there's no real such thing as green gas or renewable gas, but it is much, much more efficient way to use gas to create hot water than a gas storage hot water system. They're basically putting a big steel tube onto a gas burner and setting a thermostat on it and running it 24 hours a day. Horrendously inefficient way to create hot water. So if you've got one of those in your home or in your apartment, um, yeah, big opportunity for savings. And the other thing I would suggest is if you look at the storage tank, either the electric storage tank down the bottom or the gas storage tank, um, normally when they go, it's a catastrophic failure i.e. the tank will blow out, you'll have hot water everywhere and, it, and you'll be like, ah, just call the plumber and he'll come out, most likely replace like for like, and you'll be stuck with the same inefficient form of hot water system. So the idea is have a look at the manufacturer plate. It'll be on the sticker, the electric one will be on a little sticker, gas one inside the little flat door, have a quick look. Um, it'll tell you the date of manufacturer, date of manufacture. Um, if it's about 10 to 15 years old, go ahead and get a quote. So that when the system does go, you know, okay, well, let's, we're gonna go with a heat pump, we're gonna go with a thermal side hot water system, or look around, consider your options. Um, and there's plenty of guides online to, to make that, to making that process and going through that process to make a more energy efficient decision. But yeah, get ready. So, because when they go, they're generally, yeah, catastrophic failure goes quite quickly and you'll want hot water the next day. Um, next little area we're just going to quickly touch on is, yeah, standby power. So when I go and do a home energy audit, I get data from Ausgrid and most homes that I go into overnight, so two, three, four o'clock in the morning, as you can see on the left of the graph there, um, people are still using 600 watts of power. So, you know, that's a TV, DVD, Foxtel, video, blah, blah, blah. All those little devices are all just sitting on around the house. So it doesn't sound like much, but when you times it out, do the maths on it, that's about fifteen hundred dollars a year in standby power that you're using, just for your DVD and TV and all those little devices to be sitting on. So turn things off wherever you possibly can. I've got my home down to about seventy watts now. There's no change in you know behaviour. You can address it by little switches, standby power remote. So 
you probably don't want to crawl along behind your TV and get to that PowerPoint. So what you can do is you go down to the hardware store, you buy one of these, cost you 30 bucks. So it comes with four little switches, and you can buy them in packs of two or four, whatever. Stick it in the PowerPoint. There's a quick plug your power board in through that. Got a remote, turn it on. Powers on to the TV, turn the TV on. Turn it off at the end of the night, done, walk away. So nice and easy. You can also get what's called a master and slave power board. So you can put your TV to the master socket, all the other peripheral devices go into the slave. When you turn the TV off, everything else gets turned off. When you turn the TV on, everything else gets turned back on. So it's up to you. But as I said, standby power, it's low hanging fruit. Most homes we go into, it's normally about 10, 15, 20% of your total energy consumption is just standby power. In Europe, they call it vampire power because it's just sucking you away 24 hours a day. Uh, anyone got any questions on that area? Yeah, so um, we're going to be launching into the last bit of the talk, which is about solar and batteries. Before, before we do, uh, there's some questions regarding hot water. So there's uh -huh. a question from Judy. As a renter, I'm stuck with gas hot water. What's the best way to calculate and offset my emissions? Oh, well, basically, if you look on the back of your electricity bill, it will tell you exactly how many megajoules of gas that you're using. Um, the other thing I'd say that if you are renting, it doesn't mean that you're completely powerless to affect change within that block. Um, you know, I was on the strata committee um, at a, an old unit block and we switched out old inefficient gas hot water systems. And this is, we're talking 12, 15 years ago. And we put in instantaneous because it was just more efficient and more cost effective way to create hot water. So there are things that you can do. Um, it just, you just have to, consider what your op options are. So definitely with the hot water, because it's your biggest area of opportunity, even if you're in apartments, if it's communal hot water, yeah, you're talking about a major process and there will be um, probably in the strata, through the strata, they'll be talking about, hey, look, this hot water system, because if it services the whole block, there'll be something in there to say, right, well, you know, it's cost of life or it's lifespan is going to be X number of years, 15, 20 years. And yeah, you should be budgeting to change that out. So when that is due, we'll look to go to either solar or to heat pumps. So there's opportunities there. Um, is it possible to retain off peak hot water rate if you get solar? Solar hot water or solar PV? No, solar, I imagine solar PV. Yeah, you can. Yeah, definitely. You can. Yeah, you can, you can, you can, so when, as I said, I'm going to put in that thermosiphon hot water system, I've currently got an off-peak two tariff and my meter's been upgraded. That tariff has stayed with me. It's still there. It's me measured in my block into, um, through my meter board um, on that particular circuit. So that's already still there. So when that thermosiphon hot water system goes in, it will be connected to off-peak two. However, the law states that I can't turn that off. The law states this. Um, I have to have it connected to a circuit that will ensure that it's heated to 60 degrees at a minimum for two hours a day. So yeah, there are things you can do, but yes, you can definitely maintain that off-peak one or off-peak two um, circuit, um, or that, sorry, that offer, yeah, through after once your meter's been upgraded, no problem whatsoever. Okay, great. Um... There's a, a person who's living in an apartment, so they have a tiny electric hot water tank mm -hmm. in, in the apartment. What's the more energy efficient option since they can't replace it with a heat pump? Number one, buy green power. Number two, what you can do is there's a really clever little device, the name of which I can't tell you off the top of my head, but inside your apartment block, you'll have a little fuse board. One of those fuses will be specifically for the hot water because that electric storage hot water system, unless you're doing something crazy in your apartment block, that's at least minimum 40% of your total electricity hot, um, usage. Because if it's under 80, 90 litres, if it's only one that comes up, you know, your buy or your me, um, it'll be on what's called continuous supply. So it'll heat up the hot water, heat will slowly dissipate out of it, thermostat will go turn back on, and it's doing that 24 hours a day. And so it's just heating up, heating up, heating up, heating up. Um, so what you can do is in that fuse box, you can put a little timer fuse and say, look, I only actually need it to run for two hours of the day. 
Okay, or if you go, oh, well, I've got five people in the house, we need to have more showers, we'll just run it overnight once and then run it in the afternoon once, and that's it. So it's up to you as to how you want to do that. One of those little suffusers, that's about $60, $70, plumber to come in and install it, you know, $100, sorry, electrician to come in and install $100, nice and easy. I can't, sorry, I can't think of the name of the particular device, but I'll make sure it goes out in the notes with Nicola, that Nicola will send you. Awesome. Um... Quick question, what do you think about fancy Dyson hot and cool fans? Sorry, what do I think about what? Fancy. The Dyson, the Dyson fans. I'm sure they're very efficient, like most fans. Um, they're great for cooling. Um, if you look at the wattage of them when they're heating, they're just running a resistor element and they're not very efficient as a heater. Now, anything that uses a resistor element to create heat is really quite inefficient. Um, so yeah, great as a cooling device, blowing cool air over you. But yeah, as a heater, not very efficient at all. Um, yeah, it, compared to my air conditioning, uses less power than that. And it, it cools the whole house. And it's um, is uh, Suits has suggested that that timer suffused could be called catch power. Is that is that it? No, I haven't no, heard that okay. phrase. What was it? Catch we'll, power. We'll definitely have a. We'll definitely put it out in the notes afterwards. Um, Great, and then there's one last, there's a question actually about another comparison site that someone's mentioned called whatever, w-a-t-t-ever.com.au. Have you come across that? No, um, I have do not. Do you have any comment on that? Costa, do you, have you come across that and have any comment? Um, yeah, we have come across whatever and um, it does show green power, which is fantastic. So we support all the comparison sites that do give the green power option. Okay, I'll... Does I'll, it, um, yeah. Costin, does it, does it uh, have all of the available retailers are out, at, are out there? Um, I haven't been on there recently enough to, to know yeah. that one, Adam, sorry. Yeah, okay, that'd be more... I mean, person. obviously we prefer Energy Made Easy because it's a government affiliated site, but um, we do know that whatever is pretty good. And there's a couple of other comparison sites out there as well, um, some emerging ones, so... Great, thanks guys. Um, and now we'll kind of do the last section of the presentation, which is about solar power and batteries. Over to you, Adam. Okay, back to me. Whew. Okay, so how does solar work? Well, I mean, as a technology has been around for significant decades, almost half a century, more than that. Um, so effectively what happens is you have sunlight and it doesn't always need to be direct sunlight, even in a, on a cloudy day, um, your panels will still generate electricity. Um, you can even get in WA I've heard it re reported um, that they're actually getting some generation just off moonlight because it's basically sunlight bouncing off the moon, on really clear um, full moon days. So yeah, so basically sunlight coming along, hits the panels, and through that, it creates direct current electricity. That direct current then goes down into the inverter, and that inverter, that's the most important part of your installation, the inverter. That inverter converts that electricity for alternating current, which then goes into your switchboard. You can then either use that power in your home, or any extras that you're not using will go out through your meter, and it will be metered, and it will go back out into the grid. So that's another thing when we're talking about retailers, is that one of the things you now need to consider is that when you're shopping around for your electricity retail, you're thinking, well, what tariff am I going to be on my time of use? Am I going to be on a flat tariff? Um, can I buy 100% of credit green power from it? There's those kind of questions. Then you've also got to consider, well, what rate am I going to be selling my electricity back to you at? Because I'm buying electricity from you, but I'm also selling electricity back out into the grid, and you are selling that through your retailer. So the different retailers will offer you a different price for the electricity, and that's called a feed-in tariff. So that's something you want to consider. So when you're negotiating with your electricity retailer, you're now negotiating a, a two-way arrangement. Um, so as I said, you're first using that electricity in your home. Any excess is then going back out into the grid, which you are paid for. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So you know, if you go back, Five, six years ago, a lot of people would say, oh, panels are panels are panels. Well, you're really starting to see, as we've now had panels on people's homes um, for you know, the last 10, 15 years, we're really starting to see a much higher uptake nowadays. But the quality of panels is really starting to become a lot more important. Now, I'm not going to recommend any particular brand. 
Um, and this is a commonly available slide um, through an organisation Australia called Australian, um, uh, well, I don't need to mention them, but yeah, so LG, Sun Power, they're kind of the higher end brands and you can see the lower end brands. And it's like most things in life. You get what you pay for. It's as essential as that. Now, and the other I don't thing, mind yep. if you mention them, they're solar quotes. Um, ah, yes, solar yeah. quotes. And there's yeah. also the Australian Energy Foundation. Yeah. Um, there's also solar choice out there as well. So they're good opportunities. I don't have anything to do with them, but good opportunities. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's like most things you get what you pay for. You know, if you're going to buy a Rolls Royce, or you're going to buy, you know, some I don't want to rock a particular car brand. Um, but you know what I mean. The thing that you need to be aware of is the warranty on that panel, not just the performance warranty, but also the manufacturer's full replacement warranty. Who holds that warranty? So that's generally a great indicator of the quality of the product. The second thing you want to consider is the output of the panel. Per square meter, most panels are about no, 1800 by uh, 300, sorry, 1800 by about yay wide. So uh, they're not huge um, and they're starting to get a bit more variance in the size of the panels. Um, but how much is the output? So a lot of people say, well, oh, I've got 10 panels on my roof. Well, it doesn't matter if I've got 10 panels, it's what's the output of those panels combined. That's the capacity of the system. So that's what you want to be thinking about. So how much in watts, most panels are between 200 to 350, 400 watts. Um, in capacity of output nowadays. So, yeah, you can buy a cheaper one, which might only have 250 watts, or you can buy a higher end, which is 350 watts. It's up to you. Um, for me, as I said, I've got really good available roof space. So, for me, I don't need to buy the really, really high efficient ones, highly efficient, but I just want to make sure we get a high quality one with a decent warranty. So, with the panels, you know, there used to be a whole bunch of tech talk about oh, what was better mono, poly or, uh, or hybrid. It's As I said, it's all about warranties and output. They're the two things you need to be considering. So just going back to my point, um, pretty much all the panels, so all the panels to be sell to come into the Australian man market, they have to have applied to them what's called a performance warranty. So that is that after 25 years, they have to be performing at whatever their original capacity was at 80% of that capacity. And that has to be, it, obviously it can't be tested because we don't know what the panel is going to be doing in 25 years. So it's kind of a virtual warranty on that. Um, now, I mean, not every panel is going to make that. Um, so that's when you can start to talk to them about the, the warranty. Um, so that's why warranties are very, very important. But it's also a very strong indicator. Of, there's not much that can go wrong with the panel. Once they're up, they're pretty much there to set and forget. There's no moving parts. We are in a very temperate and moderate environment in Sydney. Um, we don't get horrendous heat. We don't get horrendous cold. There's not much that can go wrong with a solar panel in Sydney. You might be worried about hail. Most panels are going to be installed at a pitch of about 30 degrees. Um, I had hail come down at my house on the northern beach. It was coming down almost the size of a cricket ball. Um, and yeah, I got up on my roof the next day and had a quick look. There wasn't even a scratch on it. So those that are on a low angle of incident, and any panel that goes up, it has to have tempered glass, it has to pass a hull resistant hardness test, just like anything else you put up on your roof. So as I said, there's not much that can go wrong with your panels. I joke with people and say, hey, look, you know, I wish my shoulder had a 25 year percent performance warranty on my knees, but they don't. So, there's not much that can go wrong with a panel. So once they're up on your roof, they're pretty much set and forget. You're just going to make sure they're high quality, good warranty, and being installed by a decent installer. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the most important part of your solar installation is the inverter. Buy something higher end. Buy an SMA, Fronius, Solar Edge, or M Enphase. I wouldn't touch anything else, but that's just my personal choice. The next one I get, I will be getting the Solar Edge. Why? Because of the length of the warranty and because of their ability to the performance capacity. So not the performance, their monitoring capacity. So the Solar Edge Inverter, as with all of these higher end, comes with a little app on your phone. So when they install the inverter, it talks to your, um, it's your modem, it uploads data onto the internet, you get a little login, you can see down to individual panels exactly how well they're performing. So that's up to you. Um, and it, what it allows you to do is you can actually see exactly my usage and my generation and try and match those together. So 
it just gives you a visual advantage or a visual tool to be able to see exactly what's going on in your home. So that is very, very important. Um, but yeah, buy a high end. You can get a, a Fronius SMA, or I'm not sure about Enphase, up a 15 year full replacement warranty. But name another product in your home that you can get a 10 or 15 year full replacement warranty on. Yeah, I'm hearing echoes. Um, because yeah, you know, your fridge, your microwave, no other appliance will give you that sort of um, warranty on it. Same with solar panels. So just be aware of who owns those, uh, sorry, who is giving you that warranty. Make sure it's a manufacturer's warranty um, and yeah, go from there. Minimum 10 years on your inverter. If you buy, if you're getting 10 years, you're getting a high end product, SMA for any solar edge, and basically, away you go. Um, the other thing to consider with your inverter, you're always going to have to have this inverter. Um, but if you have shading, so the way they install panels, they used to always install them and they've been installed in series. So it effectively becomes one big solar panel. But when what will happen is a cloud or a tree or whatever come along, so a tree or a, a chimney, and it shades one particular panel. They might drop that panel's performance down to say 30%. What it would then do, it would drop the whole array's performance down to 30%. How do we overcome that? We put in what are called microinverters. So each individual panel is performing as, as its own entity. So that's called microinverters, or sometimes they call them performance enhancers, and they've got different little ideas of a way to call them, just marketing. But it's basically a microinverter. So what it then allows you to do is each panel in the own individual panel has one of those little micro inverters and it's wired directly back to your main inverter. So that's how you can overcome shade. It'll cost you a little bit more because you're buying additional componentry, but a lot of the panels will actually have these built in now. So if you're going into a shade environment, they'll have, okay, if you need micro inverters, these are our options. These are our panels that we can provide you. And you probably have to pay an extra 10, 15%, okay? So that's how you can overcome shade. There's also a really great tool out there that you can look at, and I'm sure this will be out in the tools um, or the notes that we'll send out, and that's called Sunspot. Um, so you can actually go in, draw a little map on your, draw a little area on the roof of your house and go, well, this is where I'm thinking of putting panels. That tool will then calculate how much capacity and much solar power you would generate over a year. So make sure you check that out, Sunspot, it's called. So, why do we want solar? Well, if you're at home during the day, and I work from home, so it's great for me, I only spend about 20, well, 30, 40% of my time out in the field. Um, so I can say, right, well, it's sunny day, I'm gonna put the washing machine on, it's gonna put the dishwasher on, I, I can do different things, I can run a pool pump or whatever, it's up to me, it's my choice. Um, alternatively, with the dishwasher, um, yeah, I can always put it on timer anyway. Um, but yeah, so generally, your consumption if you're home during the day, you tend to ramp it up during the day, peaks at around 3 p.m. and then it slowly tails off into the night, which really matches quite nicely with your solar generation profile. And that's on panels basically for 20 feet off. If you're at work during the day, why has it done that? So when you, um, if you're at work during the day, well, they don't really match. And this is where a battery might come into, your, into play for you. Or when you start to say, well, hang on, how about I put my pool pump, my dishwasher, my washing machine, put those on a timer, and away I go. I can start to use that solar power during the day. So the point that I'm trying to make here is you'll get the most best return on your investment from a financial perspective by using the power that you're generating through your solar system. And it's going to peak in its generation around one o'clock when the sun's at the top of the sky. Um, this, as I said, this is based on June North. There's nothing wrong with putting panels facing north and west. So it's up to you as to how and where you want to place those panels based on your usage patterns. So if you were to get your NMI data, or we can provide that for you. Um, basically, we can look at your average uh, usage profile and we'd be able to map that sort of thing out for you. But it's all about using that power when you're generating it. So it will take you a little while once you've got your solar in, you've got your monitoring, you start to see, oh, look, we're using this, oh, look, we're generating this. So it's about matching those two up and changing your behaviours and becoming a little bit more flexible. Um, if you can't do that, well, you might want to start to go, well, this excess generation during the day in the middle of that peak, let's put it into the battery and then we can use it during the evening when we come home from work. It's up to you, it's your choice. And I'm conscious of time. Um, we've got four minutes left and there's some questions about pricing like and, and warrant like 
how much subsidy there is and that sort of thing. So okay. I'll skip on then. Yeah. This is what your solar monitoring looks like. Yes, you are very pretty. You can throw a battery in there and you'll see the same sort of stuff as well. I won't spend too much time on that. How to size your system, basically for every one kilowatt of capacity that you put on your roof in panels. So on average, every four panels that you put on, you'll get about one kilowatt of capacity. Um, you'll get four kilowatt hours of electricity generating a day. So say you use eight kilowatt hours of electricity per day, or you put on a two kilowatt system. Okay, so that can, yeah, you can work the maths on that. There's a whole bunch of different tools out there, the solar buyer's guide, which we'll send out to you, and the battery buyer's guide, which we'll send out to you. The average system that's out there nowadays is six kilowatts. And there's two different ways of looking at this, saying, well, what's gonna give me my best return on investment? Or hey, the guys are here, let's just put up as much capacity as we possibly can. And there's not a huge difference. The guys are still gonna load the truck, still gonna come out the site, still gonna climb up a ladder, still gonna install an inverter. If they put 10 panels up, there's not a big difference in putting 15 up, okay? Um, there was, interestingly, there was a question about like how much a system could cost. So, um, yeah. like for a six kilowatt system, would you say somewhere between like four to seven thousand dollars, roughly? Yeah, exactly. It's four. Yeah, around that. Um, and it really comes down to the quality of the products that you buy, um, and who you're buying them from, and what warranties are attached to that. Um, yeah. so there is a big variation. Is a really good. There's a couple of good websites you can go to. Once again, I don't advocate any particular brand, um, but yeah, where well, you can get a comparison. Um, solar Quotes do a really good way of doing it. Um, well, solar Quotes or Solar Choice, one of the two, but it comes in a nice big tabular format. You can look at high end, low end, mid end, and away you go, and they're just a broker. Um, but yeah, there's a whole different variable, number of factors to look at sizing your system. And it's really about what, what's motivating you. Um, how much how much capacity do you really want to put up there? Are you looking for the best return investment or the best environmental output? Um, but it's all about, yeah, finding what works for you. Go through the battery bot, solar bot, clean energy council, solar buyer's got. Um, but we'll send that out to you. You get a rebate from the government. They don't like to call it a rebate. Um, and it comes in the form of what are called STCs, which is small scale tradable certificates. They're attached to the renewable energy target. So if you put in so much capacity on your roof, you will generate so many of those STCs. You will then, if you choose to, and I strongly suggest you do, sign those over to the installer and they will basically buy those from you and it becomes a point of sale um, discount. Now, a lot of people get concerned when they get a quote from their installer um, or their retailer because it will say it's only valid for four weeks. The reason for that is the very value of these STCs can change very, very quickly. They're a tradable commodity you're creating a form of currency. So when they buy those back off you, you might be creating you know, 30 STCs for an average size system, and they're gonna buy them back off you at $35. So that then, 35 plus 35, there's your rebate, they take that off your quote, and that's your form of point of sale rebate. So that's your rebate effectively from the government. Um, so those STCs, as I said, are a tradable commodity. So you really want to make sure that you're getting those STCs at a decent price or selling them back from a, a decent price. So when you're signing off on a quote, do a quick check, just Google current STC spot price New South Wales, and there'll be different brokers out there and I'll tell you what they're worth. So average price for an average brand system, as you can see, it really comes down to the quality of the product. You know, you can buy a two kilowatt system for two and a half grand, you can buy a five kilowatt system for three and a half grand, it really is, yeah, quite variable. I would strongly recommend that you only ever buy and have installed your system by a Clean Energy Council accredited retailer. Um, so, go on. Oh, and it does also come down to if it's a um, if it's a two-story house, you know, depending on. Yeah, there's always going to be variables. There's going to be exactly. variables, but. Um, yeah, there's going to be variables where your meter is, where the wiring, whether or not your meter board needs to be upgraded. Um, so there's always going to be variables. But yeah, make sure that you're getting a, a decent itemised quote um, and it lists all of those different items and what you're getting, who's doing the work and make sure that the installation has a warranty attached to it. So we're it's on... Oh, sorry. We're on 1.30 now. Um, if everyone can hang out for another five minutes, we'll try and wrap this up and talk a little bit about batteries before you all go and answer any yeah. questions as well. Okay. Sorry, do I have a habit of talking at the time? Um, 
So your average payback is three to four years. It's simple as that. The more energy you use that you're generating, the quicker that rebate will, uh, payback will be for you. Buy from an accredited retailer. You can jump online, Google them. There's a whole bunch of them around Sydney. But yeah, there's been a whole bunch of fly-by-nighters over the years. So make sure you buy from a decent, reputable company. As I've mentioned a couple of times, it's all about warranties. Panels, 15 years, inverter, 10 years. That's generally what you'll get out of the higher end installers. Um, so you can get a 15 years on inverter, you just pay a little bit more. Um, the energy market is changing as we've, we've talked about, um, but it's also now changing to the point where you can have a battery in your home and you can now start to sell that power out of your battery back into the marketplace at a premium price. So, that is starting to happen. We're also starting to see trials of community batteries coming into the marketplace as well. Um, so that's just starting to kick off AGL. Ausgrid are now starting to talk about those. So the way things are, are changing is changing quite quickly. Um, so if you don't have money for a battery now, all you need to do is make sure that your solar system you installed, that inverter is what's called battery ready. So that's another thing for you to consider. Um, so where do you put the battery? Well, it basically gets coupled into the solar installation. You can do it either behind or in front of the inverter. It's up to you, there's a number of different ways you can do it. Um, but yeah, essentially you're just basically plugging a big storage device into your solar system and onto the side of your house or onto the garage, wherever you want to install it. Um, now how, the solar, how do batteries work? You're basically taking any excess electricity that you're, you're generating out of your solar system, plugging it into the battery, and then when you want to use that power, say in the evening when the sun's not shining, you can then draw that power out of your battery. So it depends on your usage patterns. Um, I was at home a couple of weeks ago, over eastern suburbs once again, and they were you topping up the battery overnight in off-peak power, using that power for the morning peak, and then it was being topped up through their solar system during the day, and then they are using it during their evening peak usage. So it's up to you as to how you want to use, how and when you use that battery. Um, but most people, it's about topping it up and filling it up with that excess power during the day and then using it during the evening for the cooking, the cleaning, the TV, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, when you, when you think about batteries and their return on investment, um, what are they basically doing? They're effectively a storage device. All you're doing is storing electrons in, you know, you can measure those in kilowatt hours. Um, you're storing kilowatt hours and then drawing those kilowatt hours out over its warranted lifetime. What happens after its warranty, I don't know. So what we can really measure it against is their warranty kilowatt hour output. Um, and if you do the maths on that, divided by its purchase price, there was a product on the market called uh, Zeneji Aeon, which now longer is no longer around, and that was about seven cents a kilowatt hour. That makes sense at seven cents. I can't buy power off the grid at seven cents, so to be able to store it free off my solar makes a lot of sense. Um, but as you can see, the higher end products, the BYD, <coughs> the LG, the Tesla, we're talking about, you know, the BYD, it's 22 cents. Well, I can buy my power off peak overnight at yeah, 14 cents. But having said that, the peak rate 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., it's still, you know, 55 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's starting to come into market how it's starting to become viable for, for me from a price perspective once it gets down below, you know, 20, 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, battery prices are forecast to come down, um, but demand for batteries is just going through the roof globally at the moment. So we haven't seen that massive drop off in batteries. So for me, from my personal perspective, I'm going to wait a couple of years because I don't have a lot of free cash floating around. If you've got the free cash and you use a huge amount of power during the evening, and you got to put in a big solar system, well worth your while, get a battery, get it installed now, and it'll pay for itself in a couple of years. So yeah, it, it really comes down to your personal choice. There is a great guide out there, the New South Wales, New South Wales Government um, Battery Buyers Guide. So have a look at that. Um, and hopefully battery prices come down over the next couple of years. This is from Solar Quotes, really good um, guide. And you go in there, there's about 20, 30 different batteries available in Australia. It's not just Telza and LG. There's a whole range of different products out there, so shop around. Um, and there's some additional resources, questions and answers. It's only six minutes over.
Hello, Nicola. Yes, I'm here. There is a battery question. How would you sell your battery energy? Is it possible to invest in community batteries if you cannot install a battery or it doesn't make sense to install a battery? Um, the community batteries are only really just coming online now. Um, it would not coming online, being trialled um, and conceptualised. Um, in other states, they're a little bit further down the track. Um, AGL are uh, looking for participants in a trial now. Um, Ausgrid are looking at a community battery. Um, sorry, AGL have been running a trial for a while, um, but it depends on where you are. So there's different things happening. Um, but yeah, through your battery, yes, there are different tools out there. Go to a, a website and have a look at Reposit. Um, yeah, R-E-P-O-S-I-T. Um, but yeah, they're slowly working their way. There's, there's a lot of legislation that needs to be changed in New South Wales and in other states for this to become possible. Um, but yeah, the, the idea is that when there's peak demand in the network, and if you're not using a lot of that power out of your battery, the idea would you be as a, it's kind of like as a group or as a community, you could then say, right, well, let's sell that power back out of the grid because Mr. and Mrs. Jones and half the street homes in the street are cranking their air conditioner because it's a really hot day and as such we've got peak demand. Much easier to feed that power in the local network area. Um, yeah, there's a lot of very exciting and very interesting stuff yeah. happening. A lot of investment in this space and we call them like virtual power plants in communities. We just, um, I guess it's emerging. So I would definitely watch this space. I just want to say thank you to Adam for his time, his his generosity in sharing his knowledge and also Costin for being here from Green Power. And thank you to everyone who's um, stayed on um, online listening to this webinar. Just before you go, I just want to do a quick poll um, to just find out a little bit about if you've learned something new today, um, what and if there is any, if any action um, you will take following this webinar, if you can, um, yeah, answer those two questions briefly. And while you're doing that, um, I just want to also say that, um, yeah, I will be sending out a list of like great useful links and references as well as the slides um, and a link to the webinar recording um, in the next day. Um, I really hope you've learned something new today and um, judging by I've got maybe half of um, people who've answered, I'll give it a few more seconds. Um, yeah, so great to see that you've all learned something new today. <laughs> that would be one of our objectives. But also there's um, there's definitely some um, commitment to taking actions to reducing energy use and, and half of you will look into buying green power, which is fantastic, um, and obviously do some more research. So um, that's great news for us and I yeah, I hope you um, enjoyed it and I hope you have a great rest of day. Um, yeah, thanks again, Adam and Costin and Sue's in the background. Uh, I'll, so I'll say um, sayonara and have a great day. <laughs> thanks everyone, bye. Cheers. Thanks all.